Okay, welcome everybody. This is the eighth Australasian Conservation Dog Network webinar series. And tonight we have with us Dennis Ganaway. He's from Belden Environmental Services. He's going to be talking about um, water conservation using detection dogs. So take it away, Dennis. Thank you. Can everybody see the shared screen? Yep. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much. My name is Dennis Ganaway. Um, I own Belden Environmental Services. Also on the line is Ryan Lowry. You'll see him down there. Ryan's camera's not working tonight. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, we're going to run through a couple of things. We'll go through the history of our little organisation, how we got into water, and then take you through an example of Dog and his work with water. If this works, come on, there we go. So that's the team, that's us. Um, uh, my background is, is in environmental management, specifically in invasive species and invasive species management. Um, I've worked around the traps for about 20 years or so. I've worked in weeds of national significance. I've worked uh, in large scale restoration uh, projects, specifically up here in Brisbane uh, with the Two Million Trees project. Um, I've worked most of around southern parts of Australia chasing weeds and got into working with protection dogs uh, when I was working with Brisbane City Council. We had uh, the cane toad detection dog up on one of the islands uh, off of Brisbane, um, checking campers and camper vans and that type of things and uh, uh, under our program to keep Morton Island uh, cane toad free at that point in time. And that's how I got introduced to these animals. Um, we had work down in South Australia with the uh, one of the dogs that was chasing uh, one of the elusive uh, agricultural weeds down there. Um, and the name escapes me at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. A black Labrador, brown Labrador, um, probably um, nearly 20 years ago now. Uh, Ryan, if you're on, can you give a bit of your background? Sure thing. Um, so I've only recently got into this. Uh, I've finished That's two, right. yeah, <laughs> two degrees in animal behaviour, one majoring in the companion animals and then one majoring in wildlife. So sort of like a, a mixed aspect there. Um, and then through, I suppose, my, my skills with the camera, I helped Dennis out making a video with Halo first. And then that's how he sort of found out that I was already working with dogs and stuff. And then he sort of asked me if I wanted to join in and since then it's just been um yeah working with Danny since he came in and yeah really enjoying it and doing a lot of really cool stuff that I didn't really know was around until a couple of years ago. So the, the other members of the team that's uh Halo, Halo's uh we'll go through a bit of, of her history but she's my fox fox cat and koala dog and that's Danny Danny the water dog. So that's the team, and we've been operating now, uh, going on three years with, with Halo and going on two years with Danny. So Halo, uh, I'm assuming a lot of you guys would be pretty familiar with this uh, kind of work. Um, I bought Halo three odd years ago um, in conjunction with University of Queensland. Uh, Hidden Vale Wildlife Centre. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Gainsdale Hidden Vale uh, Hotel Spices out um, west of, of Brisbane um, is slowly transforming what is a cattle station into, into a conservation and cattle running in, um, area. Beautiful mountains, a lot of exotic um, pests down in the valleys, a lot of beautiful wildlife and fauna up in the hills. Uh, so we're in partnership, in ownership with uh, Halo, and her job is to do a lot of the presence, absence, and distribution work with the students and the researchers out there um, as they reintroduce, ultimately, uh, some of our more rare and endangered species into, into this property. Um, so her skills, cats and foxes, um, a lot of her work is also with councils, particularly coming up to this time of the year and onwards, we'll be chasing, uh, hopefully anyway, um, fox dens and doing uh, fox control in that peri-urban 
uh, and and urban conservation areas. So that that fulfills a lot of her time. Uh, very typically, her her strengths are long range surveys. So you know, several kilometres um, at any one time in any one direction, uh, as in everybody else does GPS tracker. And then she will run like hell, and we'll catch up and find out what she's indicating, uh, producing things like that. So that's about a three-kilometer valley, uh, which she then surveyed. And the objective were there. We were actually looking for uh, not really the presence. We were looking for dens at that point in time. But we obviously picked up, and she indicated a lot of presence and absence of, of foxes. So uh, a good little dog, keen as mustard, feels no pain. Um, and... Uh, loves chasing a fox or two. She was trained on water. She, when we initially started the down on the water route, um, it was because of this picture. Uh, a friend of mine who runs Airborne Inside uh, dabbles in drones and all things drone. And I had this harebrained scheme of tracking koalas using a dog and a drone and see if we could get the two working together. The idea was that the infrared camera would pick up the, the signature and the dog would, would make uh, finding the, the drone, at least finding the, the presence of the koala, therefore restricting the, the search area for the drone a whole lot easier. Um, suffice to say, it didn't work as well as I wanted to, but at the end of the day, it worked out particularly well from a water perspective. Uh, because Airborne then presented to Queensland Urban Utilities on one of their innovation days, they had this picture up, and fortuitously a woman who had been working with the water dog over in Western Australia happened to see the picture and go, oh, that looks like the water dog. A conversation started and I got drawn in, and that's how we ended up going from chasing foxes to chasing uh, leaking water pipes. Um, we initially started with Halo, um, and she took to finding leaking water and water pipes beautifully in the training area. Unfortunately, the urge to find cats is a bit too strong. So having her running around the suburb looking for water, you end up knowing exactly which house has all the cats and not so much of the water. So she failed her water but uh, remains a very strong and active uh, feral animal uh, chaser. So the water detection, um, as I said, there's very few of these dogs around the place. There's only um, five or six that, that I know of around the world. Uh, there's Kep over in Perth, um, and he is working particularly well. He's now a full-time employee of the Water Corporation. I have Danny here working in Southeast Queensland, contracting to uh, Queensland Urban Utilities um, and a couple of the other utility uh, companies. We've worked down in uh, Sydney with Sydney Water. We've down, been down there a couple of times. Um, they were so impressed, they uh, started training their own dogs. Um, and around the world, uh, in fact, in this June, I was supposed to go and see the guy over in, in England who's running a couple of dogs in Scotland and, and Northern England. So subcontracting, uh, and I believe there's another dog out in Arkansas. So a fairly um, narrow scope, not too many of them around. Uh, and one of the areas, one of the reasons for it is um, they're pretty difficult to uh, to train, and the complexity to getting dogs to finding water is is quite uh, is quite painstaking to say the least. So a couple of facts about uh, Danny, as I'm sure you've all seen, he's a purebred uh, Springer Spaniel, uh, two years old at the moment, male. Um, Steve Austin did the initial training for us. Uh, so he took the dog to the scent finding um, stage. Uh, then it took us another about six, I've said six months, but I'm sure it was longer than that, uh, Ryan. Yeah, it was pr probably closer to nine. It was nine months to get him to work in the field, get him to work, uh, keep concentrating and get all those distractions around working in very urban areas uh, off a lead. Um, Danny is absolutely ball obsessed, loves chasing things. So if you took him off the lead, you'd, he was last seen disappearing into the horizon. So training him to actually come back was, was kind of uh, one of our 
our uh, more difficult tasks, I think we can say. On that one, ball obsessed, and uh, he's trained on a single scent. Um, our lessons learnt with Halo was this poor dog has got such a difficult task anyway that to try and complicate it with different scents within with an area which is going to be have so many tempting smells, um, you know, ranging from uh, that sort of peri-urban bushland into into rural end of town. Uh, he's faced with so many distractions that we keep it down to that simple single uh, scent of, of treated water. Um, our training tools are, are pretty simple. It's uh, water out of a tap plus a whole lot of uh, pipes supplied to us by uh, the different utilities and what became strikingly evident very early in the piece is that um, every suburb has its own unique little uh, system of pipes anything from 100 year old ceramics in the ground to uh, brand new plastics so um, he had to then learn uh, to find or accept a broad range of of scents in which this water would sit in um, he can only find tap water, and again, uh, one would think that uh, just getting some water out of the tap would be universal across the city. It's not. Um, it's quite different. So I live only uh, a kilometre or so from a water treatment plant, so chlorine content in my water is particularly high, but if you go across the other side of the city, it's just about indiscernible. So we had to, again, expose him to this range of... Um, smells from the chemicals that are used to treat the water at different levels and different scales. Um, again, all these things you have to learn along the way. And then water is not water. Um, water but uh, has, has many different flavors as we've, we've learned. And so we've had to, to teach him to not indicate on everything from tank water to rain water to pool water to water out the creek at the, at the bottom of my property. So many 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 hours of um of exposure to all of these different combinations of of scents and only to get him to really concentrate and, and indicate on, on that single treated water um there the other thing is being in this in this new area of of detection there's not a manual on what we're supposed to be looking for so Water leaks and, and leaking water comes in a massive variety of, of different uh, scenarios. Um, everything from a burst pipe within the street to these large transmission lines to taps. We've learned uh, all sorts of plumbing that I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd know. I now know what a ferrule is. I always thought it was something introduced. Um, actually, it's the little screw that goes on the back of a tap. So this is the kind of learnings that we've had. Um, We've learned to calculate water pressure uh, and other strange plumbing and water distribution techniques and, and, and uh, language used by engineers that uh, took a little while to get used to, I must say. Um, so we've been done everything from um, put water into just slightly subsurface, uh, indicating a, a, a very shallow bury pipe down to burying pipes up to a meter in the ground, filling them up with um, you know, 10, 15 liters of water, leaving them for 24 hours so that he gets that signature sense of just the, the evaporating gases coming up through the ground. Uh, and then of course, you've got all the complexities around soil. And then we've discovered that in your more affluent areas, everybody has those little pop-up uh, sprinklers that come through the immaculate lawns they are great, except when the dog's indication is to dig a hole, which can lead to some frustration as we put back some very nice turf and some very expensive looking gardens. Because the dog has picked up that plastic and the scent of of uh, tap water being used as for irrigation on on uh, on these lawns. Um, the other point that we had to to ensure and work with is uh, getting him to work uh, in inclement weather. So obviously if it's busy raining at that point in time, uh, he can't work, but then getting him to look for just that signature smell of the, of the, uh, of the gases um, post rain, for instance. So 
getting him not to just indicate on the smell of mud or, or damp or wet. So it's been a, a pretty complex way of going through and, and we're confident we've got it. And he is, he's finding things as I'll show you in a, in a minute. Um, and I keep getting asked, so what is his target scent? Uh, and with all honesty, I can't put my hand on heart and say I know exactly what it is. Um, it's a mixture of the purification chemicals, muds, the pipe, don't know. The trainer down in, in Sydney is fairly convinced that the dog has actually learned to listen for that signature sound of, of leaking water. So, you know, maybe there's uh, some, some sensory uh, training that we still got to do with the dog. Um, we have taken both our dogs through the canine uh, detection certification. Um, uh, well, there's the certification methodology um, so that we've had him independently verified that he is finding the scent um, as we have, have said he is. So to date, it's all been going particularly well. So that's the dog when he indicates, and that's a beautiful shot, uh, shot by the ABC photographer, um, stylized as you see that it was him chasing a, uh, a berry pipe during one of his, his many uh, TV uh, appearances. He's quite the media task. Um, he's been on all the commercial channels and uh, ABC. Um, so that's a, a nice style one. In reality, when he finds something wet, that's what he ends up looking like. So he, uh, he does like a good mushy uh, leak and will dig down until he finds water. Um, I can, if you have a look, uh, his front paw is, is very delicately indicating where the leak is. So that's his, his more of his normal look once finding things. So I thought what we'd do is we'd just take you through the, the scenario of how we work and how the dog is, um, how we get our jobs, et cetera, and, and what we go through in any one particular day. Uh, we'll get a call from uh, one of the utilities. They've indicated that they have uh, a water leak within uh, a designated area. Um, their engineering is such that they can shut sections of distribution pipes off through valves, etc., cetera, um, and measure pressure and, and loss between that. Anyway, using their magic, they can calculate that within an area uh, there is water loss from somewhere. Um, they had used both acoustics and uh, all of their other methods to try and indicate where this leak was. Uh, they had no idea, um, so they called us in and asked us to uh, undertake a survey. This is the information that we'd be provided with. What we're looking at here is all of these little yellow markers with the numbers on them um, represent things like fire hydrants, valves, um, surface infrastructure that you can see. The blue line would be the trace of where the main distribution pipeline is in that particular uh, suburb. Um, and then coming off this to every house would be uh, the pipe supplying that individual house, which would terminate in your water meter box that you'd see outside of your house. So our, our sort of range, our scope of, of survey is over the main pipe up into the um, up into the water meter. Typically what we would do is we'd get the dog out um, and we would start him um, very much like any other survey. He goes through those strict command uh, measures, uh, told to, given the scent, told to find and off he goes. Because of the complexity of what we are um, looking for, the search needs to be very slow, very methodical, and we often go over a single area a number of times. As we're working with him and as he gets more experience, he's, he's been, you know, he was, he was training with Queensland Urban Utilities for nearly a year. This year he's been, he's been working and, and he's, he's up and running. 
he's learning all of the time and he is slowing down as, as you can imagine as a two-year-old male he wants to do it at 300 kilometers an hour so it, a lot of our training has been to pull that back and pull that back and really concentrate his nose on on and as close to the pipe as we can physically get him so we would do an area like this uh, we'd probably do it very rapidly the first time go back and methodically go over every inch and get him to at least sniff over everything once or twice so as you could see we would come down um, on that side following the pipeline we would then do the the um, the opposite side of the road we've never asked him or trained him to try and smell through something like a tarmac um, that's something that we're probably going to have to uh, do into the future but we've never had call to search a road per se so we've always been over grass or over at least soil uh, and then we'll survey every one of these little uh, uh, little joins to the main pipe an area like this could take anything up to about uh, two hours uh, for us to complete thoroughly so that's that's the task at hand and we tend to start on the um, where all the main infrastructure and the likely uh, likelihood of the uh, the leak is. So when the dog is fresh and still working at his absolute peak, we'll hit all the the um, the obvious areas, and then as he tires and 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 becomes less and less um, interested, we'll move into the the lesser areas. So in our quest, this is what we found. Um, this particular one, that's Danny indicating what we're looking at is this little patch over here. You can see he dug it up. When we arrived at this, this was just a uniform grass. Uh, we had picked up the fact that there was a, a valve uh, over here. Um, he took one sniff of that and bolted into this area here, dug it up and underneath all of this grass was a fire hydrant. Um, we lifted up the fire hydrant and there was an obvious leak uh, coming from that. He was praised, as you can see, he, um, he does a little bit of damage when, um, when he, he digs something up. I've never stopped that behavior because it's, a, it's actually a really easier way for us to be really sure where he's indicating. And as you'll see, it makes no difference if he digs a great big hole. Uh, in these circumstances. So typically that's what we would come across, a nice lawn. Um, there's no real indication that uh, there's a leak there. Usually if, if you've, uh, a long, on a longer term leak, you'd find that, you know, the grass would have grown bigger or it's pretty obvious in the drought. Our job was fairly obvious. You just put the dog anywhere near a green patch and it was probably a leak. So he had a real easy time for a couple of months. Um, so that's what we would find and typically that's how what we would arrive at and the dog would be then digging up the pavement uh, back to our client what we would do uh, we had both dogs running this was before we gave up on halo telling us where all the uh, the cats were and a few of the foxes in in the suburbs um, so to our client we then gave a gps point uh, this is obviously they get far more detail in name and address etc um, but again, all I would really want to illustrate was it's not a simple, uh, the dog goes over these areas multiple, multiple times. So this is just a GPS tracker. I'm sure everybody uses those. Um, so this just illustrates that, that each area is covered several times by the dog over that. So we then uh, give that to our, our client. That we found two in that particular one one on the uh, indication on the valve cover up near the top and that one that we had photographed. They then arrive with their toys and this is why I'm saying, um, pity the poor guy that went and mowed the lawn just before they arrived, but anyway. Uh, so a small section dug up by our dog is nothing compared to what they arrived with and, and the toys from the, uh, from the water utilities. Uh, the indication on where the dog uh, Doug was over here. There's this top one, that's the valve that we were talking about initially. Um, that was visible, that was the, the buried. So they came along, started digging that up. That's about a 30 centimeter hole 
that they dug and at the bottom they found this, what I now know is a feral that had been pumping out of this water for a number of days. The soil structure in that particular area was such that the water was draining straight down and away into the stormwater drains and flowing away. Um, so there was nothing visible on the top. Uh, and that was flowing, I think they estimated at about three litres a minute. So you can imagine over, over a number of years, the volume of water that was coming out of that. So typically, the, this would not have been found. And as the report says, um, and this is an extract from this report, this really illustrates the value of these dogs where no visible water was on the ground. There was some water in the gully box. Uh, and this leak would not have been found until it came to the surface. And that nobody knows how long it had been running for, but it was very unlikely that it would have come to the surface for a protracted period of time. And the guys here reported this leak has gone unnoticed until it surfaced. So at this point in time, we're probably going out and surveying um, upwards of between 20 to 30 kilometers of pipeline in any particular way. We've done surveys everywhere from the town of Jimna to at least half the suburbs of, of Brisbane, uh, some of the smaller towns, uh, the satellite towns, Bow Desert, um, and down, in, uh, down into the scenic rim, if you know Brisbane at all. Um, so these are towns of five, six, seven thousand people, and we've surveyed these entire towns. Generally, when we go out, we would find somewhere between um, nine and 20 indications. In, in that area, sometimes more. Uh, and the strike rate of the dog at this point in time, where the engineers have gone out, dug up, and actually found a fault, is upward of 70%. Now, I was horrified by that. I thought that was terrible. And they, they fell about laughing because the other methodologies that they have, um, if they get 50%, they are um, ecstatic. So the dog is doing particularly well. The other 30% where he's indicating may not necessarily be false. Of course, this could have been anything from somebody uh, pouring water on the ground, you know, out of a water bottle to they couldn't find the, uh, the, the leak or the leak is far away and, and the smell and the scent is transferring through either clay or running down a pipe or something of that nature. So there's a lot of variability in that 30% as to why the dog is not, uh, or why rather they can't find what the dog is indicating on. Um, of course, I'm completely and utterly biased and uh, convinced that. Uh, whoever's on Flyway can. If we can just make sure that they're on mute, we're just getting a bit of sound. Yep, thank you. Sorry, Dennis. Sorry, Dennis. Yeah, uh, yeah no problem. So. I'm not convinced that the dog is not finding the correct uh, scent. Um, I just think we can't find what he is smelling. And again, given the, given the brevity of what we're asking him to find, um, I think that sort of that 70% mark is, it's okay, um, and, but I think we can work on the dog. And, I, and if the experience from the guys in Perth is anything to go by, the more the dog works, the better that accuracy gets and the more the dog works out what he has to have. So he's a young dog yet. Um, so he's, I, I think he'll only get better and better at doing what he does. Uh, as far as the type of terrain that we've worked in, we've also worked in um, quite dense bushland. When we started this, this uh, whole exercise, the objective really was to get the dog working within really inaccessible places. So, you know, chasing long transmission lines through scrub, through peri-urban areas where it's difficult to follow, it's difficult to walk, um, therefore send the dog in. And we, in the beginning, we trained him for this sort of remote work so it happens that we've done more and more of the sort of urban work, but 
really, um, we're trying very hard, Ryan and I, to, to get out and demonstrate the strength of this dog's work in the bushland. And this one in, in particular uh, is, is an example of the power of, of these dogs within that. So Ryan was undertaking uh, a survey. Um, dog took off into, into an area that was quite remote uh, on next to a road sign and indicated into a bush. Ryan is then pointing out, I uh, lost my cursor, the area that he's put it into. Um, and that looks incredibly impressive until you look around the other side. That's the leak that's leaking into the channel. But the dog had found it from the other side. There's a road that runs behind this bush and it stuck his nose into this bushland uh, in there. And that's, that's really the strength of what, what we, we want to develop and keep going. Again, the dog in Perth is, is almost solely dedicated to uh, the, the surveying of these long transmission lines. We will get to that. It's just our infrastructure in Southeast Queensland is a little bit different. The Scottish dog, again, is also used both in the peri-urban, um, the, the more rural areas, as well as in the towns themselves. Typically within, a, within the urban areas, we're finding things like that leak that we pointed out. That we, but more importantly, we, we pick up a lot of these smaller leaks that will develop into bigger problems. So uh, valves, for instance, that are just starting to leak. Um, fire hydrants, an extraordinary amount of uh, leaking fire hydrants where the rubbers, etc., on those seals are about to go. These are buried quite deep into the ground. Um, and until they're spraying out water into the into the uh, into the air, nobody will ever find them on that. So that's essentially what we do. Um, I thought I'd go for longer. Was that fifteen minutes? It was about. So, it's really good. Yeah. It's um, uh, really go on. Sorry. So yeah, over to you guys. I'm very very happy for us for Ryan and me to um, take whatever questions you want on this. Love some comments and feedback. Um, if anyone doesn't want to jump in, it's really great work that you're doing. Mm. I mean, it, water is a very precious resource. We, we live in Broken Hill. Um, yep. So <laughs> we, we understand on a completely different level um, when you don't have it, how important it is. So congratulations on the work and, and um, it's excellent what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that you do a lot of roadside work and, and I've been out doing alligator weed in public areas yep. um, with people and dogs and, and all sorts of stuff and, and a young dog you've got. How, how are you, how are you um, managing that in, a, in an urban environment? Um, is it a lot of on-job training or are you doing stuff yeah. outside of work? No, lots, um, a lot of daily training so I, w I work uh, I have a property out in a, in a sort of um, peri-urban areas which backs onto a, a metropolitan area so a lot of walks uh, taking him past deliberately big dogs on the other side of the fence a lot of that reward training for concentrating a lot of ball play near those uh, near the dogs to get that that distraction um, and then training him, deliberately putting targets out very close to these areas um, and then tempting him to go at the fence or go at the ball. Um, he's probably been working off league uh, for, what, three to four months, Ryan? Yeah, um, just about three months, yeah. So before that, he was on a long line uh, and working very well. So we kept him quite quite strictly onto the long line, then trailing the long line, and now he's off the long line. Um, but as I said, young, small male dog, uh, young male dog, neutered to young, I think. Um, so he still lapses a little bit, and then it's straight back down um, in position, concentrating, reward, 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 and then move on from there. But um, yeah, working within the urban areas is is uh, has certainly challenges. Certainly, you know, busy main roads, that type of thing. Uh, we get around that by very early morning starts. So we'd be out, try and be out six six thirty in the morning, 
Um, we work the dog very intensively for up to about four hours and then that's it for the day. So we try and keep our, our work short, sharp, um, and go back repeatedly rather than trying to extend a full day. And that seems to work for him pretty well. Halo on the other side, um, you know, you put her out, she'll work, she'll work all day until she falls over. Um, but he, he needs to uh, have these short, sharp intervals in between. But he's getting, he's getting better. As I said, he's, he's a young dog. Uh, so he's he's learning all the time. Yeah, that's great. It's very similar to Ugly, isn't it? Yeah, oh, we were just saying that he's a lot. It sounds very like a, one of our young boys, and um, yeah, they are. They especially when they they get their focus in and they really want to work, and that's all they want to do. You know. Yeah. 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 We were just. And saying. if you can get him, if you can get him into that groove, yeah, then he'll go straight past a barking dog. Mm. right at his ear and he's working and he's fine yeah if he's distracted forget it um you know there's days where you put him back in the car and take him home because (laughs) (laughs) yeah not happening not happening that day at all he'll take all the treats in the world turn around go straight after the dog again you know so that Uh, that's a day where you just chalk it up to well we're not making any money that day (laughs) i think we were just saying it's that Similar thing of uh, with Oakley because Oakley is three now, and he's done alligator weed um, two years in a row now. And just watching or noticing the improvement from the first year to the second year when it really clicks for them. That our work hasn't been as much because it's more kind of uh, seasonal for the alligator weed. Yeah, you'd see that as they get older, and and just the more ex- that in field experience is huge for them. Yeah. Mm. Well, we he's on a both the dogs on a very high uh, training um, routine. They they train morning and afternoon um, for short periods of time, shorter periods of time, um, and then in between work and then as we're leading up to work, we'll then start concentrating, um, extending the training periods, making them more field based, and then get him out into the field um, around that. And is your property, is your yard then just full of dugout trenches that you've um, <laughs> done for training? I'm just thinking in my head when you were saying all that, is, you know, your property is just going to be, that's... that's. <laughs> well, fortunately, I've got, a, I've got access, to, I've got about a hectare yeah. around. But yes, if archaeologists ever dig this place up, they're going to be finding all of these weird <laughs> water distribution pipes that I've buried and forgotten and the dog didn't find, then I didn't remember where the hell it was. And, yeah. Very good. Excellent. So, is there any other questions? Yeah, just remember to unmute yeah. yourself, guys, if you do. Mark here, Mark Holdsworth. Uh, just wondering, Dennis, uh, uh, your ser- search technique, you've got a uh, pretty good mapping of the infrastructure. And yeah. I'm wondering whether the leaks predominantly are associated with joints and uh, taps, etc. And whether, yep. if that is the case, whether you could, or joints, of course, uh, whether you could sort of refine the ser- search effort, in other words, shorten mm. the search effort by targeting those particular infrastructures first? Yeah, well, that's what we tend to do. Um, it's, it's the speed of which we take him down, say, a, a, a city block, if you will. Um, so we'll deliberately slow down when we know there's infrastructure coming and he will circle that. He's beginning, uh, in the beginning, he went just straight over, uh, but we've repeatedly pulled him back and asked him to search uh, fire hydrants, for instance. So search every single fire hydrant um, to the point now where he is immediately running, recognizing them, coming around, circling them and then taking off again so we're starting to get that concentration because you're absolutely right 99 percent of the leaks are uh, joins um you know valves that type of thing um although you know we have i think we have found where certainly during the drought where um the drying clays have have broken pipes but if a pipe breaks it tends to be quite dramatic um, and then you really don't need a dog at that point in time because the water's shooting five meters into the air. Uh, yeah. But the, the the strength is that finding 
those joins tend to drip leak for months and months and months before they become catastrophic. And for yeah. our client who's Queensland Urban Utilities, that's, that's the strength of what they need us to do. They need us to find those very elusive, small things that aren't a problem yet. Thank you. Thanks. Dennis, mm -hmm. Sonia needs. Um, asking. Uh, you've been working with Queensland University. Have they been doing data? Have you done any data gathering or research around what you're doing with them? Uh, we, there may well be some. If you go on that Hidden Vale site, I think we worked with one of their honours students December last year, or well, the year before, right? Year before. Yeah, year before, yeah. The years are blurring. Um, <laughs> where we did a lot of work, they were they were doing an assessment on the best methodology for um, determining fox densities in the area. So you, they know they've got foxes. They put up a whole lot of sand traps, camera traps. Um, and then had us survey exactly those areas that they were doing and then evaluated those results. I don't know if they've ever published that. They should have by now, I would have thought. So have uh, most of the work that we do with them is very much on um, distribution and management, more land management more than research. Yeah, so you haven't done anything with the with the water dogs? With the water? No. Okay. Happy to collaborate. Anybody wants to do it? Yes. Um, I've got a student at the moment looking at um we might I might contact you after this. Sure. Time. Maybe tomorrow. I've got a student doing something sort of similar and it would fit perfectly. So I might uh, give you a ring tomorrow. Sure, no problem at all. Excellent. Um so we had a couple of um Things come up in the chat. Nick Gill, did you you had a question? Oh yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I was just wondering if um, the weed you were working with was the um, broom rape, the Orobank. Yeah, that's the one. That's the oh, one. Oh, cool! I remember reading about that years ago. It sounded yeah. like an interesting project. Yeah. So what? Um, how did that turn out for you in the end? I was just working with the guys. I was working on a weed down there called Bridal Creeper and I was sitting next to the guys that were doing the broom rape eradication. Um, I don't know if it ever got to the point of eradication, but I think the, the project went survived longer than the poor dog did, I think, in the end. They were still, oh. they were still eradicating broom rape when I left South Australia in 2008, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very cryptic plant. So it would oh, be yeah. a really tricky one to eradicate, but yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to hear about. Cool. So in those, in those days, I was just, you know, you spray herbicide on it. That's, that's what you do to kill stuff. Don't use dogs. Um, there was someone, I'm sorry, they don't have their name, but it's um, H-U-A-W-E-I-G-T-3. Um, um, Norwegian company... Norch, Dad, did you want to talk about that? Maybe you are. You don't have to. Hi, yeah, this is Ian McLean. Hello, Ian. Um, I'm a Kiwi, uh, but I'm currently living in the Netherlands, although I'm hoping to get home one day soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, Noch, Noch is a Norwegian company that I worked with for many years, and they we, we worked on the development of odor capture, where you get the odor onto a filter and then you take the filter to a dog that works in a laboratory. Yeah. So you may, you may have heard of this technology. It's been used particularly for landmine detection, but also for uh, cancer detection and, and a number of other things. Mostly it doesn't work very well uh, because it's very, very difficult to refine and tune. It, the, the concept works, but the, the action doesn't always. Uh, but this company, uh, has worked with that technology for a very long time and they have done many, many kilometres of oil pipelines searching yeah. for leaks in those oil pipelines. And, I mean, nobody, of course, knows what the success rate is because you don't know what you missed. Oh, it's 100% uh, always. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but they certainly do find water leaks using that technology. Yeah. 
Now, as to whether they're still doing it today, I can't comment. I haven't had any contact with them for a few years. In my research, um, there's a couple of guys out of Texas that use dogs on oil transfer pipelines. Um, I, I don't think this is new. I think this, it's just either we've come around full circle uh, again, um, but I can't see why this wouldn't have been done in the past at some point. No, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, using dogs to find anything that's difficult to see is uh, is popping up and has popped up for close to 100 years. What so, is becoming more and more interesting in, in this approach is, of course, the water utilities are constantly changing the chemicals they use to treat the water. So we have to be very... Uh, you know, evolve very quickly, uh, or else we're going to be left behind. Yeah, well, obviously, if you um, are working closely with a particular company, you yep. can keep track of those things. But you know, when some random outfit calls you up and says, "Hey, can you come and have a look at our pipes?" it's it's a much more difficult problem. Well, that's that's what happened. We flew the dog down to Sydney um, to do a couple of trials down there. Um, and they use quite a different chemical uh, in their water. Um, it took about a day to orientate the dog using their water, but we were successful in finding leaks down in Sydney. Um, so it can be done, but you have to orientate the dog to what he's looking for. Uh, and I assume that there might be different chemicals, but possibly they smell much the same. You know, it smells like chlorine to me. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> one of the possible applications here is uh, emergency situations. And one of the things that's always popped up into my mind is Christchurch, where the entire water infrastructure, while not destroyed, was broken. Mm. And, um, and they have spent, I didn't, don't even know how much money and how much time uh, digging up the, the, the water system. And presumably they've got it, got it down to just a few thousand leaks. <laughs> so there would have to be an enormous opportunity there uh, in terms of fixing what is now a much more difficult problem, which is all of the small leaks that's that right. inherited from the earthquakes. Yeah. I'll follow that up. Uh, on their side, the uh, Sydney Water is training a sewer dog to find try and locate where sewage water is, is uh, leaking into the stormwater system. Because, you know, I, I don't know if people are terribly afraid with Sydney, but a lot of their, their stormwater system is open channel. Uh, so that's, that's where, what they're doing. So that, that's pretty innovative, I thought. So they put the dog into these big open channels, he runs along and, and then finds little outlets where the, the sewage water is, is seeping it out. And they can trace that then back to other illegal connections or broken sewer pipes, etc. Which is quite, quite uh, in an innovative, I thought. So it seems like the bigger opportunity is to convince all of these councils that there is work that it has it's never occurred to them to do. Yep. Um, so that's that's very much our focus at the moment. Um, the so we've been working with, with this, uh, one of the, the bigger ones here in Brisbane um, that essentially supplies water to the greater Brisbane uh, and most of southeast Queensland, so probably upwards of four million odd people, um, which is quite large in, a, in an Australian context. So the, the idea is very much to expand that into the neighbouring utilities. We've worked with the bulk water suppliers as well, both here and in Sydney. Uh, in uh, briefly, I will admit, um, but I think there's still a, a fair degree of scepticism amongst the engineers uh, of, over the how well this works. So a few more conferences and uh, a few more um, demonstrations, I think, is needed. But we're getting a very good body of evidence building up over time, and and the guys that we work with within the the water utilities are incredibly supportive of what we do, and they they blown away. By the, uh... yeah, I buy that, but I, I'd like to take you back to the, the earlier little discussion about are you working with any scientists and is anybody gathering any data? And your answer was, not well, not point. really. 
No, no, at this point, no. And, and the problem is that when you do a demonstration to people and they see your dog find a water leak, it's enormously impressive. And if they're not scientists, they will go away probably quite impressed. But the problem is you haven't actually demonstrated anything in terms of uh, what your statistical probabilities are and what your true general capability is. And that's where you need to be working with those scientists to generate the real data that will convince the engineers. Any, any scientists wishing to volunteer? Yeah, I'm so I'm gonna, there we are. Done. I, have, I have a student, I'll, like I said, I'll contact you tomorrow. The biggest issue with, with that is uh, dogs. So when you've only got one or two dogs, statistically, it's difficult. But Dennis, if you've got other contacts doing this, there's no, re no reason. My, at the moment, my students are all stuck at home, so they're quite happy just talking to people and getting data sent to them. So. Um, if There's you've two got, of us in Australia, and I can give you the contacts. That's exactly together. right. If we've got other contacts, we can. My student can, or uh, well, my students. There's two of them. Uh, can do the digging around and start gathering a bit, even just to do a lit review style data analysis would be great. So I will talk to you tomorrow. But yeah, that's the that's definitely a thing. Is that that data there? That's what will push councils and um, government bodies into to really, you know, if you've got something published. It's, it does give you a bit of backup. Of course, of course. Um, That's excellent stuff. We've just got a couple of extra questions and parts in the, um, a couple of people have left and Nick Gill said it was lovely seeing everyone and thanks Dennis, it was a really interesting presentation and, sure. um, and such a challenging target owner, which it would be incredibody difficult. That's, um, that's problem solving at its highest. Um, Doug has shared a link to Hidden Vale Wildlife. Um, yeah. Yep. So um, I'm, I'm assuming that's that's I'm um, including the dog as one of the survey methodologies. Would that be right? Yeah, that's him. Yep. Perfect. Um, R. Miller would like to say, would the dog work with a farmer pumping a dam water, for example? Only if it was only if it was treated. Yeah. I was thinking about the raw water on Stradbroke Island too. That's a large pipeline going down the centre of the island. Yeah. But, uh, so it's no, untreated. no, it wouldn't, because um, we very deliberately what train them off anything that's not a treated product. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to. I mean, it would be great. But then you know you're going to be hitting issues yeah, you're going to have there. Is you're going to be hitting natural springs, creeks. Who knows. I had a question, Dennis. Hmm. How are you going? I'm Nick. Hey, Nick. Um, you said that your dog is uh, primarily ball reward based, which is um, really cool. I was curious, when your dog's in the field and you're doing your searches, so not your training scenarios when you yeah. know mostly what's happening or you put highs and things like that. When you're doing your searches in the field um, and your dog alerts, do you? I'm curious what your reward process is. Do you reward for every alert not knowing if it's one of the 30% that is it necessarily one that you would consider a true alert or maybe a false alert or do you do you wait and dig around before your reward or how does that work for you? Again, so, uh, a lot of it is, is how confident the dog is. If he's circling around and, and he's kind of uncertain himself, he, we might pull him back, put him back on. Um, if he pounces on, on his scent, starts digging a great big hole, he'll get a reward and we'll reward off that. Um, again, we can't always verify what he is smelling. So if that leak is a meter under the ground and he's picking the odor up, I'm, we can dig as much as you like. You're not gonna get down to the wet stuff to verify uh, what that leak is. We don't have the time of day to do that because we've got an area to cover on that. So we would reward on that one. Yeah, and there's, it, it does heighten the risk of a false positive. Um, but given the, complex, yeah, given the complexity of that, um, yeah. it's, I would rather have some of that false positive than to teach him off, uh, teach him against um, indicating whenever he's, when he's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool, thank you. Well, that, that has been an hour. 
and and a little bit. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, since that flies when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> very very interesting. If no one if if no one has any more questions, because I'm sure no one's off out doing anything tonight, but um, I will <laughs> stop the recording now, um, and just say thank you very much, Dennis, for a really fascinating presentation.